Okay, uh, Psalm 1. This has probably been my tough, uh, probably the hardest sermon I've had to try to put together, try to get it organized, prepared to get this idea. It's going to be very complex. But it hopefully gives us understanding in, in many of your personal relationships. So this is, uh, yeah, we'll see. Okay, Psalm 1. And let's go and pray first. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand this. I pray your spirit would give me wisdom to know how to put this out uh, properly. And I pray you'd help all of us to understand it. Uh, and Lord, I do ask that your spirit would have liberty and you'd bind all unclean spirits that they will not blind. And uh, close ears, help us to see this, this actually, this vital truth in our, especially in our personal relationships and in many cases, very serious uh, situations. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Psalm uh, 1, or Psalms, no, Psalm 1. Psalm 1, uh, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, uh, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Okay, the second half is about the ungodly. The first half is about having a blessing of God. And you'll see a progression or digression in verse 1 from walking, standing, sitting. And so the one I'm looking at this morning is sitting in the seat of the scornful. So uh, this morning, the title of this, I usually don't give it, is Calmly Scorn the Scorners. Okay, and uh, as I mentioned, this has been a tough one to try to organize, try to get it um, uh, simplified. And it is very complex and it encompasses all of us in many ways in your various relationships of life. Um, it has been a long occurring difficulty that uh, has been in our family uh, going on nine years. I don't say hard, I don't say very many things. Uh, very rarely talk about Heidi and her difficulties. Um, I rarely mention it. It's a very heavy burden, sometimes overwhelming burden that we are carrying. But uh, praise the Lord, we have learned uh, many things from it and have been able to help others in the same difficulties. Uh, I would rather read a book about it rather than learning from it directly. But this past week or two, Jan and I have been listening to so many videos and talks about this tough topic. And all I'm going to be able to do is just hit the tip of the iceberg. So we're just talking the tip of the iceberg. Below the water level, there's a big ice uh, thing that... If this, uh, if this rings a bell with you, hopefully we can direct you to where you could uh, listen more about the idea. Okay, now if you would go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, Paul describes, um, describes the general spirit of the closing days of the church. Okay, this description, we, I, you know, I know several people that meets a lot of these qualities. Uh, one in particular that we've been dealing with on this idea. So chapter 3, verse 1, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Okay, here's the description. Men shall be lovers of them own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, Unholy, without natural affection. Okay, this person has does not have the ability or has lost the ability to empathize and doesn't understand love. Truce breakers, habitual liars, false accusers, incontinent. That's without control. When they get in this um, mood. They will do anything and almost anything, everything. Fierce, that will be the outcome of the incontinent. 
despises of those that are good. So when you experience this, you are experiencing frontline battle experiences. Hand-to-hand combat with the enemy. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. Yeah, they, they can even appear spiritual and be saved. But denying the power thereof from such turn away. Okay, that's plan A. So I want to describe to you, and as I mentioned, Jan and I have been, Jan and I have been listening to dozens of video broadcasts on this idea. The description will be a narcissist. Okay, what is a narcissist? Now, in 2 Peter chapter 3, seems to be the final description. A fella that's been on the road of narcissism has gone all the way to the end. Okay, now, it, that's a transition. Now, in order to learn something about these things, you may have to get uh, involved in a psychology profession. And Luke 16 will give us advice on that idea, because sometimes the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. Now, the problem with the psychology profession is that they do not look at the spiritual aspect at all. That's a, non, that's a non-topic. And so they're missing out on that. And the other problem is that most psychologists today are trying to control these abnormal behaviors with medication, mind-altering medication, which makes it worse. And a lot of these mind-altering medications will be... Um, if the thing the news media will never tell you is that these so-called mass shootings, some of them I think are faked, some of them are planned. Are, and one thing they will never mention, they will never mention the medication the shooter's been on. Columbine, those two boys, they picked up all the medication. That was not discussed. Okay, and then some of it I think is fake, just totally faked shootings. And some of it is definitely staged. The latest one, the one in Nevada, there was definitely more than one shooter. Many eyewitnesses said that, and it wasn't coming from the 34th or 31th floor, it's coming from the 4th, and it was coming from the ground, and it was coming from helicopters. Okay, and so we're being played. Okay, by who? Narcissist. Okay, narcissism is, is an amazing idea. Okay, now, uh, a person that <laughs> is a narcissist, okay, I'll describe it a little bit. I think a bipolar personalities will be very akin to it. Okay, bipolar is often a diagnosis psychiatrists talk about, but they never talk about uh, spirits. It could be bipolar, tripolar, quadruple polar, whatever. Okay, uh, the Jezebel spirit is another idea that you can get online and listen to. That's associated with this idea. We've learned that. Uh, Verbally Abusive Relationship is a book. The first book we came across by Patricia Evans is a byproduct of a narcissist. In that book, the first time we read that is after Heidi, and we'd helped Heidi escape from her situation. She came across that book in a library. Coincidentally, it had 10 statements, and, and the author said that if you've experienced two or three of these statements, you've experienced verbal abuse. Heidi experienced nine out of the 10. And the only one she didn't experience the other one because it was something you don't remember the last time and she remembered it. Um, the liberal mentality of politics and religion, I believe, is another mental disorder of this idea of narcissism. I've got my T-shirt that when we get back out in the streets, it has liberalism, find a cure. Okay, and I firmly believe it. Boy, it does a trick. It really does a trick. And I have it on, you know, there's a reason for it. Now, this morning, I would just give you a tip of the iceberg. Hopefully, this will spark further study, if it, especially if it's in your life or if you something you've got to deal with. All of us got to deal with it somewhere along the line. And hopefully, we can provide you an avenue of escape from the abuse or manipulation. Uh, and hopefully, uh, we can help you to learn how to deal with um, certain personal relationships with others. Uh, so I'm hoping that this will offer hope to the abused, but for, to the abuser, I'm not giving any hope, very little hope. Because depending on how far down this path they are, it's pretty well gone. Okay, so I want to describe the narcissist to you. Okay, a narcissist has an excessive interest in himself. I'll use him most of the time, even though it goes both sides. Now, obviously, there's a healthy form of narcissism. Infants and children, obviously, we start off that way, right? We're all that way. 
Okay, so that's, that's a natural, normal thing. That's a healthy form of narcissism. Obviously, there's got to be times we've got to take care of our physical body. Now, a wise parent, wise parents will discipline, train, and or punish selfish foolishness that's bound in the heart of a child. Okay, that's what parenting is supposed to do. Okay, and hopefully the parent will train the child proper self-worth and the worth of others. Okay, but obviously we know that parenting has pretty much gone out the door. So narcissism is being bred in the homes and in the public schools and in society. Now, if, uh, if narcissism persists in an individual and develops into an unhealthy situation, watch out. Uh, if you're unable to avoid it, there are some proper boundaries that you can uh, develop and maintain to protect yourself. Okay? Now, the narcissistic personality disorder has the similar characteristics of a sociopath. A sociopath is a personality disorder manifesting itself in extreme antisocial attitudes where they will just fly off the handle for no reason. And then it will also have similar characteristics of a psychopath. A psychopath would be uh, serial killers. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and more so in the criminal aspect of a psychopath, a person suffering from chronic mental disorder with a abnormal and violent social behavior. Okay, and so, um, so some of these uh, descriptions I'm given will be mostly on narcissism. If a person's gone down to a sociopath, especially a psychopath, there's no hope. You know, it's, it's up to God what he's going to do in that matter. Okay, so four basic characteristics of a, of a narcissist. Number one, a grandiose view of oneself. Okay, what do I... Okay, he has an inflated sense of self. He uniquely believes that he is the best in everything and everything he does is great. Actually heard a young man say that he was the best preacher in Australia. I won't tell you who I heard that from. Okay. Actually thinks you're Superman. Or Batman. Now we know little kids get to run around here, Batman, Superman. But when they get up in years, I hope they're, they've gotten over that. If not, the one way, a good way to learn, teach a kid that you're not Superman, tell them to jump off the building. So you cannot leap tall buildings in a single bound. <laughs> okay, a narcissist, he is the center of the universe and he sees everyone else as tools to serve him. He deserves special treatment and is to be admired. Okay, you'll see this in political figureheads. The Clintons, Obama, Bush, one, Bush, two. Okay, uh, they crave admiration from others constantly, and criticism is a great wound to their spirit. The narcissist is never wrong, but he remembers every time you wrong him. Social media feeds his ego and a false perception of himself. Any conversation with a narcissist will always turn back to the narcissist. He is a drama king or drama queen who creates scenes and plays the victim. He's always the victim. This is this victimhood mentality that we have in our culture. It is narcissism in the socialist in a social society. They will play the guilt trip on the, the person's the real victim. He will habitually deceive and outright lie to main, maintain his distorted view, worldview. He is always the victim of every circumstance, and this is the basic foundation of the entire liberal agenda. Liberalism politically and liberalism in the, in the Christian realm. In the Christian realm, it is narcissists are being fed into that. Okay, and it's just phenomenal how that's booming. Why? Because society is that way. Okay, so that's number one. He has a grandiose view of himself. Second two the idea, a character, they have a sense of entitlement. Hillary was entitled to be president. That's what she believes to this day. Nothing will change that belief. 
Uh, the narcissist resents the challenge of his rosy view of himself. He scorns with open content or disdain anyone who challenges him. His arguments are unreasonable and illogical. They have no sense to them. And don't try to figure it out because when you're dealing with spirits, when the spirit gets involved, there's no logic to it. He is cold, angry, and withholding from the challenger. In-law relationships, often if there's a narcissist involved, say it's a mom of a child, the way she punishes her mother-in-law or father-in-law is when, they dis when they've challenged her is she would withhold the grandkids from them. That's what they're doing. He will manipulate in order to maintain his false perception. Number three, he needs admiration and attention. That, that's all it needs to be explained on that. Number four, amazingly, he has problems with empathy. He downplays the normal feelings and interests of others. He is an ardent competitor. He is the best and deserves the recognition. And he will openly attack his competitor with ruthless tactics. He will emotionally, verbally, and physically bully his tools or people. Because he views people as tools into subjection. Now, if you, you know, by chance, if you are experienced of this and it is a physical abuse, my advice is call the cops. Don't mess around with it. Now, I understand, okay, I understand um, a lot of times when people get involved with somebody that's been in a physical or verbal abusive relationship and maybe there will be a separation, but the person will go back and people say, I don't understand that. That is another byproduct called learned helplessness. That's a whole other area and a person can understand what's going on. Some of it's spirits, but some of it's a learned helplessness because, because they've learned. This is why most Americans don't vote, because nothing changes. They have learned helplessness. It's a very interesting study. You can look at it online, type it in, and you can see the um, experiments uh, on that study. The narcissist enjoys hurting people. He enjoys it. He will create a drama and push the person, a normal, healthy individual, into a corner until they react, and then he will smile. Yeah. Personal experiences. Hurt people hurt people. Okay, uh, second idea. I want to give you some history and prophecy of a society overrun by narcissists. Okay, in Esther chapter 3, you may remember the story, a guy named Haman. Dr. E. Haman is a type of the Antichrist. Okay, Haman, a second ruler in the kingdom. He's got all the money he would need in the world. He's got all the power in the world, but he got upset because one guy wouldn't stand up. You want to experience that in real life? Go to court and don't stand. Whoa! I've done that. Anybody done that besides me? You will watch a judge with a toupee will flip his lid just because you didn't stand when he walked in. And the rules say you don't have to stand. Attorneys have to stand. Nobody else has to, but they all do it. Watch the, dete watch the uh, deputy. Whoa! Somebody's got problems. Full-fledged narcissist. Quite an experience. <laughs> Very intimidating. So what I do after that is I walk in after he walks in. Okay. Um, but Haman, Haman, upset because one guy wouldn't stand for him in the street. One guy. What do you want? He wanted to murder the guy. And then he shifted and wanted to murder an entire race of people. Scorner. Amazing. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 19, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, they are types of Muslims. And they were scorning the people when they were rebuilding the wall. Some people are going to be upset because somebody decided Jerusalem was in the capital of Israel. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? Scorners and narcissists, it's a big deal. It's drama, man. Drama time. Time to riot. Time to kill. In the Bible, Psalm 22, verse 7, the crucifixion psalm, it says that the people laughed Jesus to scorn. What kind of an individual can sit there and look at a body on a cross, size of a pumpkin, back look like hamburger, and sit there and laugh about it? No empathy. Narcissist were the ones instigating the crucifixion. Pharisees. 
In Psalm 79, it talks about the Edomite. It is a passage about the tribulation, and it says the Edomites will laugh to scorn. Psalm 79, I'm going to get it and read it here, 79 verse 4. It says, we are become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to them that are round about us. That's the Edomites. That's the general makeup of the Muslim uh, society. If you would look at Isaiah 28. This will be doctrine. This is a tribulation tyrants of the tribulation time period. Isaiah 28, verse 14. Now, another person in the Bible is a type of the Antichrist is a guy named Jeroboam. 20 times in the Bible, it says that Jeroboam caused Israel to sin. 20 times it says about that. Jeroboam was the guy that took the 10 northern tribes and Rehoboam the two southern. And then on one of those occasions, it says it provoked God to anger. Now, I want to come back to that thought on that passage. But in Isaiah 28, verse 14 Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Scorns, when a scorners rule a society, it's, it is bad, man, it's bad. Because ye have said we've made a covenant with death and with hell are we in agreement. Who makes it a deal like that? Not somebody that's got a healthy mentality. Now, if you go to the next chapter, the media industry is loaded with narcissists. It is the driving force of the media industry, and they will ruin anybody and anybody they, they don't like. This is what Roy Moore, Moore is experiencing. Now, I don't know, if he's, I don't know if what's happened is not. Obviously, the accusers are lying about a lot of things, but they will destroy this man. If he's Democrat, he gets promoted. Why? That's a narcissist. They live on their feelings. Okay, here, if a guy's out in the street, remember that Jesus told the apostles, you have to be wise as serpents, as harmless as doves. That was in his age, and as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the days of the coming son of man. And uh, Noah dealt with these same things. Isaiah 29, 20. The terrible one is brought to naught, and the scorner is consumed and all that watch for iniquity are cut off. The scorner would be that advanced narcissist. Now notice, that make a man an offender for a word and lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate and turn aside the just for, for a thing of naught. It's where you can be imprisoned for words you say because it's offensive and hate speech. You have to be very careful what you say in the streets. You don't have to compromise anything, but you need to be very careful. Because the media industry will bring in the enforcement officers, and when the enforcement officers came to John the Baptist, they said, what shall we do, John? And he said, do violence to no man and accuse not any falsely. That's the issues of today. Well, we see how practical this book is. It is, man, you get all them pieces put together. And scoffers, scoffers was uh, and some people that Noah had to dealt with in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, in the last day scoffers. So this is akin to scorners. So that's some of the history and prophecy. Okay, now I want to give you plan A and plan B. Okay, if you come across a scorner, narcissist, sociopath, hopefully not a psychopath. Okay, if they are within your life pattern. If they are within your sphere of influence. Jesus said in Matthew 10, look at his advice when he told the apostles. So the Lord Jesus, uh, while during his uh, ministry, okay, logically, how could a mass of people brutally murder, torture, a man who went around for three and a half years doing good. How could they do that? Well, Jesus said, ye are of your father the devil. So this is a society that has been infested with narcissism. In Matthew 10, Jesus said to the apostles, he said, behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. 
Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Key, key. Oh man, harmless as doves. Calmly scorn the scorner. Harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and they will be brought before ye will be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up brother to death. I thought blood runs thicker than water. Family members turning each other in. And the children, the father of the child, the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Now that's tribulation passage. That, that would imply to me that the apostles are coming back. They just might be. So, ideal plan, plan A, to scorn our scorner calmly and leave. Walk away. Hang up the phone. Okay? That's plan A. Why? Because they're under the curse of God, Proverbs chapter 3. Do not argue. Do not explain or rebuke them privately. If it's a personal conversation, do not argue, do not explain. If you say it's black, if you say something is black, they're going to say, why did you call me black? You racist bigot. They will turn the conversation absolutely cattywampus and you will say, what did I say? Do not argue, explain, or rebuke privately. Okay, scriptural proof. Proverbs chapter 9. For a normally mentally healthy person, when you see the reaction after what you just said, you... you I, don't, I don't get that. It makes no sense. Proverbs 9 verse 7. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame... Why? Because they are going to have drama and they're going to dramatize it right in public. Okay, then he says, And he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a, a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, he will love thee. Proverbs 13, verse 1. A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. Proverbs 14, 6. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. 15.12 A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. You can't help him. You can't. I can't. I don't care how sincere you are. Your lips are moving, but it's not sinking in. So, if it's a phone conversation conveniently have something going on. I'm sorry, I got to go. That's how you handle it. Biblically, that's how you handle it. Do not argue, do not explain or rebuke privately. Okay, now let's say a public setting. Proverbs 19.25. Okay, let's say it's in a public setting. Let's say I'm in a street corner passing out tracks and I'm get, talking to a kid and got another kid with him and I realize, oh man, I got a narcissist. I got a scorner. And he's trying to bring me into his uh, side to convince this simple-minded one, this new newbie, trying to get him, hey, we're on the same page. Okay, Bible tells me, smite the scorner. And the simple will beware. No, that doesn't mean I can take the Bible and whop him upside the head, even though that would be nice. And then I can prove the Bible that way. So look at it, the Bible says, the ringing for the nose bringeth forth blood. Your nose is bleeding. See, the Bible's true, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, in the New Testament, we are not to uh, do this carnally. We are to do it verbally, and we can do it with calmly, and we can do it with a smile. And that is the best way, and the only way. He says, smite the scorner, and the simple will beware. Reprove, and reprove one that hath understanding, and he will understand knowledge. Chapter 22, verse 10. Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Now, when you're in authority and you have that authority, do it. Okay, give you an example. I've mentioned this guy before. 
uh, is a guy that was in the Rensselaer jail. Uh, his uh, wife gave birth to Siamese twins. The twins were attached. I don't forget where. Uh, they were going to do surgery. They were going to uh, detach the twins. Uh, the, the surgeons and the doctors knew that one was going to immediately die, and the other one they didn't know if would make it. So Oprah Winfrey had this guy on the, on the show, and they raised a bunch of money, okay, supposedly to help this guy and his wife and the children and everything. And this guy, you know, liked to, uh, you know, not baking soda, but, you know, white powder, he liked to sniff it up. And in jail. Oh, but he's a Christian. It's Christian cocaine. Whiny, little, snivelly, little brat. So I'm in a jail. This one guy, Christian guy I've been witnessing, talking to. He said, hey, you know so, who so-and-so is in here? And I said, so? And he so-and-so came up. Oh, Christian celebrity. And he wanted me to talk to him. And this guy started whining. Oh, the world don't accept me. I said, join a crowd. Don't accept me either. Oh, I abuse drugs. I'm not. I said, no, you don't. You just take them because that's the way you are. You're wicked. And that's how I dealt with the guy. And he just stood there and took it. I, I knew the little weasel was just one. Ooh, 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 ooh. And finally he walked off. And the Christian guy's looking at me like, I'll explain it later. So the next week I go back in there and the Christian guy said, what What you do that for? I said, He's Christian? Yeah. I said, I'm Christian? Yeah. All the other guys think we're the same? Oh. I said, you got it. Had to do that. Had to do that. I said, I bet he didn't have much good to say about me after I left. He said, whoa, was he mad. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then he and another guy started saying something like, oh, drink the Kool-Aid, drink the Kool-Aid. It's kind of funny. On Saturdays, they had the same meal every, every week, bean soup. And he had Kool-Aid on it. And one time, they brought the, the thing in, and the guy standing there, and I looked around the corner, I said, I served the Kool-Aid, see ya. And I walked out. <laughs> Just let him stew on it. Social justice warriors are narcissists. Liberalism is a byproduct of a society of narcissism. Sodomy transgender, transsexual, transracial, and soon to be trans species is a byproduct of this. Ezekiel 16, 49, the sins of Sodom. What are the sins of Sodom? One, pride. Two, fullness of bread. Three, abundance of idleness. Four, they would not take care of the poor and needy. No empathy. No empathy. What does that lead to? No empathy. Bullying nature, it leads to violence, verbal and physical abuse. And that's why God flooded the world, because the world was overcome by narcissism and spiritism. And it got to violence. And God said, too late, done, we're out of here. That's what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Where are we at? Where are we at? Now, Christ's response, the Lord Jesus Christ, how did he respond to the narcissistic Pharisees? He'd answer a question with a question, and it got to the point where they durst not ask him any more questions. And then he laid out Matthew 23, and I'm sure people said, well, he's just not loving. Well, you let that guy just run, and run with his tail between his legs, because that's what needs to be done. That's Christ-like. And you're not doing it angrily, you're not yelling, you're doing it very calmly, very gently, but you're allowing the Word of God to dig in and pointing out the hypocrisy. This is one thing I was amazed with in Vietnam. In Vietnam, they don't, at least the ones that we talk, don't yell and scream at each other. They use stronger words, but very calmly. I stood right beside, beside the Vietnam pastor and Mike Roberts standing beside him, and Mike said, he is ripping into this guy. And he's just calmly saying, he's using stronger words. He said, that's how they do it. Okay, that is an amazing thing. And so a person can, by God's grace, learn to handle these things as the Lord would want us to. You don't see the Lord getting all ballistic when these guys brought in, did he? When he's going through the crucifixion, the Lord was not nervous about anything. Not a thing. 
The thing that bothered the Lord on the, on the Garden of Gethsemane was the broken fellowship between he and God. With man, he sees the whole picture. It didn't matter. So plan A, scorn calmly and leave. Second Timothy chapter 3, withdraw thyself. Withdraw thyself. Okay, now plan B. Okay, that means that uh, it's a relationship you can't get out of, or it's a boss in the job, or it's a family member, okay? We need to respond properly to the antisocial drama of the narcissist. Okay, so we need to understand the false perception. Here's what you need to understand. They have a false perception that you are the bad guy. Nothing's going to change it. You're the bad guy. He believes feelings are facts. His perception is not healthy, logical, or reasonable. But it doesn't matter. He will look for evidence of mistreatment even when you treat him respectfully. And he'll find it. Remember the Pharisees said they tried to catch him in his words? That's why they brought the woman uh, that was taking adultery in the very act. They thought they had a catch 20 true. And the Lord Jesus Christ masterfully handled that. Just masterfully. It's an amazing thing. Now, what they do is they create drama. In Acts 17, verse 5, here you got Paul and Barnabas coming in. All they're doing is expressions. Hey, how about this? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And who caused an unruly riot? Not Paul and Silas. It was a narcissist that were pushing it. They're going to cause a drama. It is going to be drama, drama, drama. Why? Because they live by emotion. And so what do you do when you have that drama? And when they express this uh, feeling that they have and they're in your face and they're expressing it and they're yelling and screaming, you just say, calmly, I disagree with your false perception, but you are entitled to your opinion. And walk away. But then they will ramp up the drama. And if you break, and I'm not saying you're not going to, because from experience, you know, when you're going through these things, there's going to be times you're going to break and yell. You'll see a smile come on their face because it worked. They enjoy that. Their spirits inside them get a pleasure out of that. So the feelings of the narcissist, you just say, are not my responsibility. Do not react to the emotions. Learn to respond, respond calmly and without emo emotion. As an individual, if it's a situation where you, you just can't walk away from it, plan A, plan B is uh, establish personal boundaries that are deal breakers. When the other violates your respect or trust. Okay, let's say this narcissist is just going at you and you're calling you every name in a book. You just stop, put your hands up and say, hey, uh, this is unacceptable and I'm not going to take it. Walk off. Hang up the phone. Okay, or stand your ground where they realize if you cross this boundary, this pit bull is going to bite. And you build that little fence around that. Okay, what, what are you doing? You're doing what a parent should have done years ago. A two-year-old tantrum tantrum is one thing, but when he's a 30-year-old doing a two-year-old temper tantrum, you can only be young once, but you can be immature all your life. And that's where boundaries are set. Okay, and again, it's a different level. I remember playing against a fellow, he played for the Chicago Bulls. Uh, we got playing uh, basketball over there at, uh, when was at Grace College, and these guys were just intimidated by him. And I stood up to the guy, you know, I'd set a pick, and he'd, he'd break the pick by chopping me in the throat. Now, that's real effective. You're standing off, <laughs> you know, like that. And so after the second, after the, he did that once, I said, oh, I'm going to be ready next time. So here comes he, and I'm setting a pick, and I, I'd go like this. And then he kind of spouted back to me. I said, you know those are valid, and we were fine from then on out. I wouldn't say he was a narcissist. He was just an individual. You got to stand to him. Okay, and so uh, you got to have boundaries. There's a boundary. You don't talk to people this way. 
I, it's amazing to me how people talk to other people. I mean, they just treat them like dogs. Now, the difference is your dog will get over it. But we don't. Those are wounds that goes in the heart. Okay? And so, people should not be allowed to disrespect and abuse another. What do you do? You tell them. Verbalize it. If you don't, they think you like it. If you don't raise an objection, you have no objection. And so that's why you got to verbalize it. You can respond calmly and respectfully and walk away. Romans chapter 16, 17, it says, Mark them to cause divisions and avoid them. So that's a biblical thing to do. Boundaries is an adult way of punishing improper behavior that a parent should have done years ago. And so that's what we do. What a person has to do, you have to ignore the provocation and react like a gray rock. Okay? Got big drama going on and there's a rock in the corner and it's just sitting there. And that's what a person has to do. Okay, you say, I can't do that. I didn't think I could either. But I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. 1 Kings 15.30, and this is one of those 20 verses where it says it provoked God. A narcissist will provoke God himself. And that's when God steps in. Can you imagine somebody at a white throne judgment and are going to provoke God? The Bible says they're going to do it. Can you imagine the earth being exploded? People inside the earth are going to be floating, and here they are in front of God Almighty at the white throne judgment, and they're going to challenge God. Narcissist, psychopath, sociopath. It's an amazing thing. That human spirit with the pride of man. So a person needs to remember the phrase, slow to anger, is found eight times in the Bible. Six are describing God's character. If you would, let's look at two. That's for us, man's behavior. Proverbs 15, 18. Proverbs 15, 18. As I mentioned, uh, we could point you to uh, uh, the best websites or the best uh, videos that we've listened to. And there's one uh, that is a, a lady actually interviewing a man that has been uh, diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. And she must have caught him on a good time because he is honest. And you will not believe what the man says in his thinking. Phenomenal. Uh, if you want to look her up, little shaman. Doubt she's a saved gal. But she has probably over a hundred talks about this. And then one of them is an actual interview. And, I mean, I don't know how many times I've listened to him over and over and over. But this idea of slow to anger, Proverbs 15, 18. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeases strife. Okay, so you got a drama on the job. Slow to anger. You can probably diffuse the drama. 15.1, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Okay, so possibly you can diffuse the drama by properly handling it, slow to anger, and that's when you're in the front lines. And that's the best soldier of all, Proverbs 16.32. Oh, yeah, a person would love to fight fire with fire. You would love to... Ooh, ooh, in the old days, you could do that. Not these days. Proverbs 16, 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. It takes a greater soldier to do that. Stand there and take it. React calmly and walk away. Don't let them control your emotions. You have no right to control theirs. And they're trying to manipulate theirs, and it drives them batty that they cannot control your emotions. 
You see, a lot of times, the problem is not the problem. The problem is our attitude to the problem. And so these are plan A, plan B. Hope this has been a help to you. I'm not going to have an invitation for all narcissists to come down and repent. Oh, thank you for telling me. (laughs) But I'm just telling you, this is our relationship with people. Let's pray. Lord, I do pray it. Oh, God, I pray that this came out exactly that pleased you. And I, Lord, I just pray that you'd help each and every one of us to know uh, how we can do that. Lord, if by chance some of us got some of the unhealthy narcissistic characteristics, help us to ask you to change us. Renew our mind. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to be faithful to your words. Help us to, Lord, you've had so many people cross our path. I would have rather read this in a book than had to personally experience these things. But Lord, I just pray you'd help us to be able to help others because there are, man, our whole society is being overrun by this now. Oh, God, please help us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.